Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Church, you may be seated at this time. <coughs> Interesting how huh? we, we finish up Christmas, and we've been talking about the baby Jesus, and all of a sudden we move again, and we realize, my goodness, he did come to die for you and for me. And we can never remember that. We can never forget that. We must remember him. It's the second phrase of a song, if you may. He came, yes, but he came to die so that you and I would be family forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, the resurrection church, the resurrection of Jesus Christ affirms to us that he is indeed the son of God just as he claimed to be. We find that in Romans 1 verse 4. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ also proves that his sacrifice for sin has been accepted and that the work of salvation is complete. We learn that from Romans 4, 24 to 25. Now, when we say that the, that the work of salvation is complete, it means that we cannot, as human beings, add to our salvation. Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection and ascension, doesn't mean it was 99.9% .9 complete. And you and I add the point nine to make it complete. It's already complete. All we can do, and it's hard for us. It's hard for us because we're prideful human beings and we want to contribute something, contribute to the cause. But all we could do is receive what has been done for us. And that's so hard. It is hard for us to receive that sometimes. It's hard for us to receive uh, help from our neighbor. It is hard for us sometimes to call our adult son to come over and help us. It's so hard for us to uh, accept uh, a generosity of another family towards us. It's just a hard thing to do. And so when it comes to salvation, it's the same thing. We want to do our part. We want to meet you halfway, Lord. You can't. There's nothing that man could do. And so salvation, the work of salvation is completed. The resurrection of Jesus proves that. And church, those who trust in him can walk in newness of life because he is alive and imparts his power to them, to those that would believe. And we learned that from Romans 6, 4 and Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, walking in newness of life. There was a time where I struggled with that. There was a time where perhaps you struggled with it until we just started, Lord, you've got to help us in these areas. But it is possible to walk in newness of life as your relationship with the Lord grows, as your focus uh, uh, tunes into him more and more, availing yourself to study, availing yourself to fellowship, availing yourself to reading through the Bible in a year. Doing that part on your, doing that effort on your part results in walking in newness of life. <coughs> Our Lord's resurrection also declares to us that he is the judge who will one day Come, and he will judge the world. And we learn that from Acts chapter 17, verse 30 through 31. The message of the gospel rests on the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. When the early believers discovered that Jesus was alive, it made a tremendous difference in their lives. How did we find them? We found them weeping. We found them bummed out. We found, we found them depressed. We found them kind of slipping into uh, a depression and we could say almost a darkness. A darkness because they weren't remembering the words. They weren't uh, uh, encouraging another in the words that Jesus had spoken to them. So they were in darkness, if you may. When the early church when they discovered that Jesus was indeed alive, it made a tremendous difference in their lives. And it's the same for those who claim to be Christians today. There are a lot of people in a lot of titles. Let me give you some titles. 
There's Lutheran. There's Baptist. There's Assemblies of God. There's uh, uh, Episcopalians. There is all these little titles, all these little titles, and, and they, they, most of them would say, most of them, that we are Christians. But there's too many of them, or too many of us, that group ourselves in that Calvary Chapelites, if you may. There's so many of us that haven't discovered that Jesus is alive, that he's more than something we know intellectually, something that we uh, kind of acknowledge and we pay reverence to, might even go into our church and bow, right? Uh, it's more than that. That's a religious understanding. Jesus wants you to know, to discover, as the early Christians did, that he is alive. He is alive. He sees you. He knows your state of being. He listens to you. And he's looking out for your goodwill. When we discover this, when we really embrace this, it makes a difference in the world. A huge difference in the world. It is amazing. So our lives are changed tremendously. Let's begin. Let's look at verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they, that's ladies that had uh, prepared the spices, uh, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, there's two reactions to that. You can say, the stone is gone. We didn't even think of how we were going to move that stone. We just came with a heart, willing, and, and here's the stone that's moved. And like our Pentecostal friends would say, glory, hallelujah. Right? We would do something like that. But they didn't. They're perplexed. As we'll get into that in a second. How would you respond? What would have been your thoughts? You've arrived and the stone is moved away from the tomb. Well, let's make some observation. First of all, the first day of the week is Sunday, right? Sunday. Jesus rose very early on a Sunday, and so the early church, again, began to gather on Sunday morning ever since that day, as we do today. Now, you might say, but Pastor Ben, we heard and we know that there are churches that gather on Saturdays. And it's true. And they do, and some of them simply because they do not have room for those that come, or these churches make it convenient for others. And church, I want you to know, there is no Christian law against this. And truly, for you and I, who are believers in the Lord, every day should be a day that we spend with the Lord. <coughs> so look, God knows our motives. He knows what you're up to. If you're saying, well, our church goes to church on Saturday, and I'm a really firm believer in our church, and I back up my church and this and that. But the Lord knows that, really, you're going on Saturday, dude, because you want to catch the ball games on Sunday, all right? And you want to, you know, you just want to sleep in and whatnot. And there's other things that are going on in your head. And, and that's why the other part will come, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. And we gather, most of us, on a Sunday. And the Lord wants you to gather. Well, can I serve the Lord from my bed? Yes, you can. Can I serve him from a mountaintop? Yes, you can. But he asks you not to forsake gathering together. There's a reason for it. There's a reason that we build each other up and we help one another out. One of us could be in need, and, and if the need is made known and it's something that we can all pitch in and do, we'll do it. You know, there's reason for fellowship, you know, and, and that's why he encourages us through this word. So, again, God knows our motives. He knows what you're up to. So, as the word of God states in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, the last part says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So for those of us who know the word of God, we have more to consider as we're working out our salvation, right? To do it with fear and trembling means with respect, but at the same time, if you know he knows your motives, you need to be aware of that. God's spirit doesn't condemn you. God's spirit convicts you. So that you can walk a straighter walk with the Lord. You could be better used for the Lord as he uh, uh, opens up opportunities for ministering. The second observation from these uh, first couple of verses. Listen, we do not know exactly what time Jesus arose from the dead. Only that it was very early. However, we do know, according to Matthew 28, 
verse 2 through 4, that an earthquake and an angel opened the tomb, not to let Jesus out, but to let the witnesses in. To let the witnesses in. Come and see, go and tell, was and still is the Easter message or mandate for us, the church. Come and see. We're the only, if you call us a religion, we're the only religion in Christianity that's based on the resurrection. We're the only ones. Everyone else has their stories or whatever. We have an account. And so witnesses that the tomb was empty is the reason that the stone was rolled away. The Lord moved it away, not to let Jesus out, right? Third observation. As I pointed out to you before, the last ones at the cross are the first ones at the tomb. Verse 10 gives us at least three names of the women that were there. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. And again, it mentions other women that also came to the tomb. I'll come back to that in just a minute. But church, remember that when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, when they went to Pilate, came back and took that body down from the the cross, Jesus' body, and placed it in a tomb, there was not enough time for a complete embalming because Passover would begin at sunset. So what is happening with these women is that they were now coming to complete the task. You might say, well, that's kind of odd though, right? I mean, three days dead uh, or after Passover uh, and, and what not three days dead, you know, uh, wow, really? Listen, they did not come to take his body out of the linen cloths. So if you've ever thought about that, what are they coming to? How are they going to embalm? I know what all they embalm today. Is it the same kind of thing? They did not come to take his body out of the linen cloths, right, in which Jesus was wrapped. But they came to anoint his face, right, anoint uh, uh, perhaps his head, uh, perhaps his wounded hands and his feet. So they came to place these sweet spices upon and about the body. Again, you're thinking, is this strange? Not really. What do we do today? What is it that we do today? Today we bring flowers to a memorial service of a loved one, right, or a friend. When we are at the graveyard, at the gravesite, we place flowers or roses on top of the casket. Why do we do this? Well, we do this as they had desired to do back then to show goodwill, but here's the bottom line, to remove or soften the sting of death. That's why we do it. It's easier for a child to come and put a flower or a young person, a teenager, on top of a casket as they say goodbye to grandpa or grandma you know, than any other time. If it was just the dead body, we'd be a little kind of like, gosh, it's kind of gross. What the heck are we doing here in the graveyard? You ever open the casket after a few days? Have you ever seen a dead body after a few, a few days? No, that's not the prettiest sight, you know. Uh, so this is what they were doing. That's the embalming process, putting spices, doing this and that. And that's why we go and we place a rose or we place a flower on top of the casket. We do it to soften the sting of death couple of thoughts to consider here, if you may, right? Number one, don't allow yourself to be bothered by the amount of expensive flowers that one would send to a funeral home or to uh, a church in honor of their friend or of their loved one. I've been to many a funeral. I've been to many of graveyard service. And I've heard people whisper, gosh, that's sure a lot of flowers. Gosh, that was, those were expensive. I know how much flowers cost. I mean, what are they doing? That person is dead. Why are they spending their money like that? It's almost like Judah saying, couldn't this be sold for something more when Mary wants to anoint the feet of Jesus? Don't let that bother you, church. Get it over with. Right now, bro, get it over. These ladies did not give or have second thoughts regarding the money that they spent on the spices or the time, the labor uh, to prepare them they, that they secured for Jesus. Listen, church, it is a rule of charity. Well, let's put up slide number two. The rule of charity from 2 Corinthians 9, chapter 7, 
first part. It says this, so let each one give as he has purposed in his heart. The Lord notes that. When something in your heart says, ah, I'm going to do this for the Lord. I'm going to do this for that person. I'm going to do this. Hey, that's between you and the Lord. That's when it's pure. That's when it's the purest of intentions that mankind can have. So the Lord says, let each one do according to his heart, what your heart says. If you want to give a dozen roses, then give a dozen roses. If you want to give, if you can only give uh, two flowers, but that's in your heart to do it, then give two flowers. The point is that let each one give as he purposes in his heart. And that's what the word of God would say to you and I. That's what we're supposed to do. Second observation is a second thought here. These other women. What's up with these other women, right? These are the women whose names are not mentioned, although they did not secure the spices. Although they did not uh, prepare the spices, yet they would go to the tomb. They would be all fired up and go to the tomb. What's with that? How does that happen? Well, let me share how that happened. They had heard about Jesus. And it's interesting, a few months ago, when we were studying through the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament study, the Shulamite had given such a positive portrait of the bridegroom that in chapter 6, verse 1, the daughter of Jerusalem asked, Where has your beloved gone, O fairest among women? Women, Where has your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? Church, here these unnamed other women also desired to go to the tomb because of the zeal of the named women. The zeal that they had for Jesus Christ. They knew him. They wanted to do the best for him. And these other women just checking them out saying, I want to go. I want to do something. Let's put up slide number three. Zeal, if you may, right? Zeal. Uh, the zeal of some, of some provokes others. That's just the way it is. The zeal of some provokes others. Uh, zeal means, uh, and this is my point, Great energy or excitement in the pursuit of a cause or an object. That's the uh, meaning of it. But let's think about it. It's New Year's. It's New Year's. So what about this for a resolution? May we as the Calvary Chapel Manchos family uh, have such zeal for the Lord that it will provoke others to do more for the Lord than any other previous year. How does that happen? You know how that happens? By you and me being so involved in the Lord, loving the Lord so much that others are kind of checking us out and, and saying, gosh, you know, maybe I want to do that. Years and years and years ago, at our old church, when Judy and I first came, we had, uh, through a job transfer, I worked in aerospace, and I, I moved from Orange County down into San Diego, San Diego uh, County, North County, San Diego. And the church that we started going to it was Calvary Chapel, and uh, uh, I noticed the men. And I always, I sat, and the church was Pretty good-sized church, about 2,000 people at church. And uh, uh, I noticed the guys, they would serve, and they would serve communion. And, and in those days, the style of that church was, for a communion service, the men would come down, and one of the, the pastors, they already blessed the, the, the communion uh, service, and the guys came out, and they give the trays out, they give the trays out, and the guys would go by the side, and they'd start serving. How many of you guys have witnessed that in churches? Amen? Okay, so I wanted to be a part of what the guys were doing. Just wanted to do that. Uh, I, I saw them, and I'm sitting in the pew, and I'm saying, I want to just get more involved with the Lord. What does it take? And so their zeal, these guys' zeal, provoked in my heart that I would also get involved. And I thank the Lord that I did, right? Zeal, right? The zeal in you provokes others. And if you're missing a little zeal, if, you just, if you're just a dud, Christian duds, we have a lot of them, you know, just duds, you know. Uh, you know, ask the Lord to wake you up. Ask the Lord to do something special in your life so that you serve. And if we're running out of things for us to serve in the uh, church, what's wrong with then doing what we used to do in the old days to get more guys involved? You know, there's a lot of things we could do. Church should never be in a box that we only do a certain thing a certain way all the time, and it's so predictable. Right? We do it because there's a sense of order. Please do not misunderstand that. We're not throwing order out the door. But sometimes maybe we need to stretch a little bit, you know, and, and be involved. We would like 
certainly, and I want you to think about it, that you as you start this relationship with the Lord, improving your relationship with the Lord in this new year, that perhaps through your zeal as others watch you, you might bring someone to the Lord as well. You, they might want to get involved. Lastly, church, if you never have noticed, I want to make this observation with you and share a comment. Please note again with me that they came very early in the morning. It's the second part of verse 1. And the comment I want to share with you is this. It is always, early in the morning is always a good time to come to the Lord, to spend time with the Lord, to get your day started. I know it's hard, especially for those of us who struggle to get up at the crack of nine. You know, it's just hard, you know, sometimes to get up at 8.30. You want me to get up at 8.30, 8.15? Yeah, you know, <coughs> probably the best time. Um, let's put up slide number four. From Proverbs 8, verse 17, and, and I like what the New King James Version, the way they put it. This is the way I memorized it when I was a kid. But it says this, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Wow. Wow. You know, that was King David speaking at the time. But I, I got to tell you, if that's, you know, the, Lord, the word comes from the Lord, and it's a good thing. This is a great thing. I have another comment for you, and this one is from Pastor uh, teacher and Bible commentator John Corson. I, I sure hope we can, you all get an opportunity to meet John. He's getting older in age. He's just as gray as gray can be now. But uh, he was here a few years back. We had him at Buena Vista. We were up in one, uh, sorry, some of you guys, Buena Vista, uh, you know, that uh, are up in the, in the hills uh, at uh, one of the uh, Young Life camps up there. And John came and we had a men's uh, uh, retreat for all the state of Colorado. It was a wonderful time. He's a great pastor, teacher, Bible commentator. But he says this, quote, Truly, those who seek the Lord early, then he writes a comment, early in life, early in a situation, right? Early every day will uniquely find him. These precious women would prove to be no exception, end of quote. That is true. If you're a young man here with us today, or a young woman here with us today, this is the time to seek the Lord. Early in life your life you will prevent so much junk in your life later on you will be I, i'm telling you you'll be miles ahead and that's why we encourage you as young parents get your children involved in sunday school get them involved well my kid will stay i get it i know i'm running out of time right oh, let me just tell you this real quick my last little girl her name was megan most of you guys know her she's now like 34 or 36, she's probably using a cane now. I don't know. She's getting old like everybody else. Uh, but, but check this out, right? So we, we arrive at this new church in Vista, Calvary Chapel Vista, and is taking the kids to Sunday school. And of all kids, so Judy's, you know, taking the kids to Sunday school and trying to meet and greet people, trying to get to know people and get our family inside, get them connected. And Judy, I find Judy in the lobby or in the car. I said, what are you doing in the car? He says, well, Megan wouldn't go. She just started crying. I said, well, what, she's seven years old or six years old or eight years old at the time. I forget. Well, you know, she's still kind of young. I said, kind of young my foot. You know, you, you get another Sunday with her. Next Sunday, same thing. Judy, what happened? She just started crying. You're done. You're just done. Dad's turn. You know? Put Sarah in class. Andrea, oh, yes, I'm happy to go to class. You know Andrea, right? <laughs> oh, but put her in class as well, right? And here comes Megan. I put her in class, and she starts crying. I said, stop crying, you know. And she goes, but I don't want to be here. I said, okay, let's go. You know, I took her outside. Kapow, wham, bam. You're going to Sunday school. You're going to behave, right? Took her in. You know, she stayed there. How was Sunday school? It was all right, right? Next week, I took her. I says, are you going to stay? Let's go. Outside to the car again. Katow, katow. That was it. Listen, parents, the word train up your children in the things that are, you know are best for them, you can't quit being a parent when your daughter or your son is five years old or six years old or eight years old. Let the world quit. Let the world do what they're doing with their kids right now, that they're all smoking and doing their bombs at 9, 10, and 11 years old, but not for you. You're a Christian parent. You have knowledge, you have light. We must train up our children in what is right. 
Our kids hated homework. What are you going to do? Oh, I can't let them do homework because they cry. Really? Really? No. Eat your dinner. I don't want to eat my dinner. Well, then you'll have it for breakfast. You know, you either train them, you either train them, or you will have problems when they're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. You got to do it. You got to be involved. And, and so this is how it starts. Find what works for your family. Every family is different, right? Every family. Today, with the technology and this and that, I, I hear some, my, my son Ben discipline his kids. Well, hey, no tech time for you for an hour and a half. You couldn't say that in the 60s or 70s. Tech time, what does that mean, right? But that's how they do it. You know, you find what is right before God, you know, before your family, you know, and, and take care of those, these things. Why did I went there? I forget. But anyway. Oh, yeah, uh, these precious women early in the morning. I was talking about to seek the Lord. Something about early in the morning. After a grandfather lost his treasured watch during a family gathering, he called his grandchildren together and told them he'd pay them $25 to the one who found it. Oh, this sent the kids on a mad scramble, running and screaming and turning over every rock. But the youngest grandson just sat and watched his brothers, sisters, and cousins all come back empty-handed. The next morning, at breakfast, he handed his grandfather the watch. How did you find it? asked the grandfather. I just got up early and listened for the ticking, replied his clever grandson. Wow. Church, there's some, some timely advice in this little story, right? Oftentimes, there's so much commotion and noise going on all around us that to hear the Lord in the middle of the day, oh, it's just difficult. The time to hear him is early in the morning, just as these women did. Verse 3, look at your Bible. Then they went and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Church, the other gospel writers tell us that these two men were angels. Luke implies here that the angels actually appeared to men as men. As men. The women saw two men. Yes, they wore shining garments. Perhaps even there was a luster about them as we learned when the angels came to the shepherds and made the announcement in Luke chapter 2, verse 9, right, uh, that the baby Jesus was born, the glory shone around them. So, yes, they were shining, but they appeared as men nonetheless. Listen to me, church. We are beginning a new, a new year. And we talked about zeal for the Lord and how it can provoke others, and that's what we want to do to provoke others to honor the Lord. <coughs> but here, understand that when we get to heaven, this is the future, this is the future, go with me on this, when we get to heaven, it is very possible that we are going to be amazed at the fact now that while we were on earth, we indeed had contact with angels. Why? Because they appeared like men. They appeared like men. Observe with me. There is no mention that these two angels that appeared to the women had big, fluffy wings as our kids' coloring books. Some do, but not all, right? Not all. It's obvious, right? Why make this observation with you? Let's put up slide number five. From Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, God's word says this. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Hmm. New Year's resolution. Entertain strangers. Check. See a little box? Oh, we didn't put a box up. Okay, couldn't find it. I found it on emoji. I found a, a box, and that's where I, I got that from. All right. So on my notes, entertain strangers, and I have a little box. Check, right? What's a New Year's resolution for us? Should be thinking about that. All right, let's move on. Verse 5. I just realized I'm running out of time quickly. Verse 5. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, the ladies, they said to them, the angels, why do you seek the living among the dead? Church, in verse 4, 
the women were perplexed. Stone rolled away, empty tomb. But note, church, too many Christians often perplex themselves about that which they should comfort and encourage themselves. Just saying, there's two ways to look at an empty tomb. It's empty. Oh, my gosh. What is going on? Peekaboo, no one's in there. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what this means. Please give me five minutes while I finish my latte while I think about this. Too many Christians stay perplexed. They put themselves in a, as the world calls, a negative. Instead of saying, wow, it's empty. What does this mean? Lord, what do you get? He's not here. Jeez, hmm, let me think. You know, what could this mean? There's always two ways of looking at things, right? Too many of us spend too much time being perplexed. Not a good thing. Instead of, uh, we should be comforting and encouraging ourselves and, and others through this. Here in verse 5, they were afraid and so bowed their faces to the earth. Church, the angels, now listen to this, perhaps chiding them. Everybody knows what the word chiding means? And they're like, come on, man. Wake up, man. You know, kind of like that. The angels, right, perhaps chiding them because Dr. Luke doesn't say the angels asked them, right? Did you note them? But Dr. Luke writes, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? It's almost like, what are you doing here, right? Think about this, church. You don't buy a new car at a used car lot. You just don't. People say, well, I'm going to go get a new car. Where are you going? I'm going to, and they mention a couple of used car lots. You're not buying a new car, bro. And I'll get this. You're buying a, a used car. There's nothing wrong. Just say, I'm going to buy a new-to-me car or whatever. But you don't buy a new car at a used car lot, nor do you look for the living at a cemetery. The two don't go. You just don't do it. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Church, witness is hereby given that Christ, that he is among the living about Christ. This is what the witness is. Why are you seeking him among the dead? Christ is alive, and the witness is here saying that the angels of him, Hebrews 7, 8 states, of whom it is witness that he lives, and therefore a comfort to all believers that he's alive. I know that my Redeemer lives. For because he lives, we shall live also. Because Jesus is alive, right? But a criticism is given to those that look for Jesus among the dead. That look for him among the dead heroes of the Gentiles' worship, as if he were but one of them, right? That look for him in an image or a crucifix, the work of men's hands, or among unwritten traditions and inventions of man. And indeed, as a late Bible commentator, Matthew Henry states, quote, all they that expect happiness and satisfaction in the creature or perfection in this imperfect state may be said to seek the living among the dead, end quote. The angels aren't mad at them. The angels chided them, but they go on to assure them. Look at verse 6. He is not here, but is risen. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? Saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And, and my Pentecostal friends would say, glory, hallelujah, right here. And they remembered his words. A couple of observations here from verse 6 and 8. Number one. The women seem to accept the reminder. And so they rejoice when indeed they remember Christ's words to them. Application for us. Remembrance of the words of Christ will help us to a right understanding of his providence. That is, why God allows some things to happen. You and I must know the word of God. We must remember what the Lord has said to us. Second observation here. Since I know some of you will consider this new year... Uh, as a resolution to entertain strangers because they may be angels, here's an observation from these angels that appeared at the tomb that should help you discern correctly. And that is this. These angels from heaven did not bring forth a new gospel. Note that. Because some religions have been formed because they said the angel has spoken to them and there they are forming new gospels. Note from the Bible, note from the angels that come from heaven. They did not come with, forth with any new gospel. 
they brought to mine and put them in mine the words of Christ, teaching them how to improve them, teaching them how to apply them. Jesus said he would rise on the third day. Come on, man. Come on. What does that mean to you? That means he's not going to be here among the dead. We need to have that back in our minds. We need to have the word of God speak to us, and we need to respond to it as believers that our Lord is not dead. He is alive. We have to go there. We can't be perplexed. It's not a time to be unneutral and not sure. It's a time to go forward. And that's the difference from the angels above or Satan appearing as an angel of light. The ones that put us in mind of what Jesus has said and reminds us of what God has said. That's where we want to go. Verse 9. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Listen. They were probably not together in one room. They were probably in the different houses. Everyone that came back went their way and they shared all these things. That's how the word started getting out. Immediately everybody was sharing <coughs> and their words seemed to them like idle tales or nonsense. And they did not believe them is the end of verse 11. Church, although these women were telling the absolute truth, the recipients thought nonsense and did not believe them. Wow. A couple of observations here. Number one, unbelief will cause us to spend longer time in depression or darkness. And that's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. Secondly, it's been said that wise is the man who takes serious the, what appears like idle tales, of the woman in his life. For therein often lies great truth that will shine light in his darkness. If your woman is coming up and, <laughs> hey, don't just write her off. Woman, you're babbling. You're speaking nonsense. You might as well listen to them, you know. And who knows what the Lord's going to do with that. Last verse, first part says, but Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Church, after the first thoughts that the women were nuts in what they had shared because it seemed incredulous in his gospel, in his gospel, John, the apostle John, uh, writes in chapter 20, verse 3, that he and Peter ran to the tomb to check out what the ladies had said. And because there was no more guards there, I'm sure. <laughs> but here is what I want to share with you. Peter, as we all know, had sinned greatly against Jesus in that he had, bet uh, he had uh, betrayed him three times. He had denied him three times. He had said he did not know him, right? And yet John most likely kept his arm around Peter, right, and stays close to him. Stays close to him. As... Um, Again, John Corson would note here, he says, this is the kind of biblical Christianity we need today. True brothers and sisters who say even to one who's blown it big time, I'm still with you. I'm still for you. I'm not going to run away from you. I'm not going to turn my back on you. Church, we need more Christians as the apostle John in today's time, last part of verse 12, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. There we go again. Not remembering Jesus' words, not remembering that he must rise on the third day, but he's marveling, he's thinking, what could have happened? I want you to note in your Bible the word cloths, as in linen cloths. Note that it is plural. The implication from the Greek text is there was more than just one piece of cloth used to encase the body of Jesus, right? Which should make us suspects of religious findings such as the Shroud of Turin, Turin, right? They say it's one cloth, has the body and the, probably the, the, the x-ray or some kind of thing of Jesus. No, 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 no. Look at your Bible. It says cloths. It's plural. There's not just one cloth, right? And as you know, church, we as human beings have a tendency to love Indiana Jones type stuff, right? We love to find and see treasures, and we see them in their physical things, in their physical worth, but that's the opposite of the Lord. 
It's the opposite of our Lord. Our Lord, our Heavenly Father's purpose in leaving the cross there, right, is for the, us to see the spiritual things. He's risen. Check it out. Check out the cross. He's not there. Peekaboo. You can do whatever you want to do. He's not there. Father God wants us to go towards the spiritual. Indiana Jones types wants us to stay in the physical and put him in a museum somewhere. And when people get all caught up with the, with the whole physical uh, uh, things about treasures, you miss the whole point of the Lord. How he wants you to move into the spiritual things. The cross laying there should have moved Peter from marveling to himself at what had happened to realizing and jumping for joy that Jesus was not there but is risen. Indeed, as we close here for today, I pray that you have come to believe in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus the Christ. And if you are here today and not yet considered asking him into your heart as Lord and Savior, may you do this today. Our desire for you and our prayer for you uh, is that you would realize that, listen, Jesus is not dead in some tomb in Israel. He has risen. He is risen. He is alive. And he sits today at the right-hand side of the Father on a throne interceding for you and I. Interceding? What do you mean by that? The devil, your accuser, knows that you blow it every day. And all you can do is say, amen. I do blow it every day. He's your accuser. But Jesus is saying to you, listen, if you die without my forgiveness, if you die with sin, any sin, the number two pencil you stole in the second grade, how you talk back to your parents when you, when you knew everything, when you were 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, right? You know, your attitudes, you know, your, if you die with your sins, you will be separated from eternity with the Lord. Therefore, God who loved man sent his son to take your place. The baby Jesus at Christmas grew up to be a man, and died in our place. But if you ignore that, if you just leave it up here in your brain, if you just say, yeah, I know about it, and it's just up here, and it never comes down 14, 16 inches to your heart, when you say, as Mary, the mother of the Lord, in her Magnificat, as she says, my Lord, my Savior, right? My Savior. If you don't get there and realize that you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know, and accept him into your heart, you will not make it to heaven. You will die in your sins, and you will be eternally separated from the Lord. Our prayer is that, yes, you know, but that you embrace him with your heart. And if you've never done that, that you do that today before you leave here. As our prayer team will come up and we'll pray with you after the service. And so let's close now. Father God, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for your goodness to us, Lord, to inform us, Lord, to guys like Dr. Luke making it so clear for us, Lord, to understand what you have for us, Lord, and what you want us to remember. Lord, we pray that if there's anyone here, Lord, that has not yet come to you, Lord, as Lord and Savior, that you would speak to their hearts, Lord, and today would be the day that they would discover that you are alive and that they would ask you to come into their heart, that they would have their sins forgiven, Lord, and they would join the family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.